Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. My name is Bob Lieber. I'm a regional director with Men and Mice. I am also joined by Mr. Karsten Strothman, who is our distinguished trainer for today. On behalf of the entire Men and Mice team, I would like to welcome you to our webinar series. For this particular webinar, we're going to discuss the dangers of DNS reflection attacks and how to mitigate them. As a reminder, all attendees will be in listen-only mode during the presentation. However, we will conduct the question and answer session at the conclusion of the presentation. And now I'd like to introduce Mr. Karsten Sprotman. Thank you, Bob. Hello and uh, welcome for, uh, to everybody um, to our webinar here, The Dangers of DNS Reflection Attacks. So, it's about DNS today. And uh, DNS, that is this um, system, you might know, that is used to translate names such as www.menomize.com into addresses. Something like this address. But also DNS is used much more than just translating names and addresses. It's used today as a service locator, uh, where to find a specific service, as a trust system, and also sometimes as, as a reputation system, like in, in, in email. But DNS has a problem. And that's not a new problem. It's a small problem in the beginning, but it's, it's growing. It has been a, a rather old problem already because the problem is inherent in the DNS protocol. It has been there since the very beginning of the DNS protocol, that is since uh, 1983. But it has just been not popular in the past, but it's getting more and more popular with troublemakers. And uh, while we have seen this problem appearing over the last 10 years from time to time, it's really since last summer, that is summer of 2012, that we have seen large-scale uh, attacks using this problem. So what actually is the problem? To understand that, we have to look in how DNS works. And here we have a small, simple diagram. On the left-hand side, we have a client machine that will send a DNS query. In the middle, we have a DNS caching server on the right-hand side we have authoritative service, a root name server on the top, a top level domain server for the German DE domain, and another authoritative server below there. So the user types in, maybe in a browser, a URL containing a domain name, and the client system sends a query. A DNS query is a relatively small piece of UDP data. And a caching server that receives this data tries to resolve, and usually if it doesn't have this information already in the cache, it goes to one of the root name servers. It gets a large response back, which is a referral telling the caching name server, I actually don't have the answer to your question, but go over there, go to this DE top level domain server, and that one will maybe have an answer. So the caching name server goes there, ask the same question to the top level domain server. Again, big answers coming back, um, bigger than the original question was, uh, bigger in, times of, uh, in terms of uh, the data being sent over the network. Uh, this time again, it's, uh, the answer is, I don't know, but go over here, there's another server that might have the answer. And now that is the authoritative server for the answer. Answer comes back and it's being given back to the client. Now that is the normal operation of DNS. Our observation here, and that is crucial to understand the reflection attacks, is that DNS answers are larger than queries, and that is almost always the case. Here we see the query and the answer from the previous example. 
Uh, the first line is the outgoing query. And that one was 45 byte in size. And the answer coming back is 159 bytes. So that is more than three times, actually 3.5 times bigger. Um, that's already quite big, but that is not the biggest answer we can get from DNS. There are other examples that we will see later. But first, let's look why is it bigger. Uh, here on the left hand side we have the original answer in uh, the, the query in full detail. Uh, a DNS query contains a header, now that is in every DNS query and also in every answer, and it contains the question section, which contains the uh, question being asked. Here it is the question for uh, the quad A record for IPv6 in the network class internet for a domain name called www.strodman.de. The answer for that question is shown now here on the right side. It contains also a header. It contains the very same question section again, so that is repeated. And then we have the answer. We have an authority section, and sometimes we even have what's called the additional section. And that is what makes the answer bigger, because it must be bigger because the same header and also the answer is contained, uh, sorry, the question is contained in the answer. So it's always more data in the answer than there was in the query. Here we see another DNS query and the answer for that. It's the query for the domain name ic.org, that is the organization providing the bind name service for UNIC, and um, it's for the record type of any. Any is a special debugging record type that's defined in DNS that returns all resource records that are available for a given name. In this case, all resource records for the name IC.org. The query here is just uh, 36 byte, but the, the answer is 3169. So that is 88 times bigger than the original query. And that is because there is so much data on um, that little name, on IC.org. We have uh, a list of name server records. We have uh, digital signatures for DNSSEC, an IP4 address, IPv6 addresses, mail server addresses, and text records that are used to fight spam, so-called SPF records. So where actually is now the problem with the bigger answers? The problem lies in the uh, use of UDP uh, for DNS. UDP is a sessionless protocol on top of the IP protocol. It basically a fire and forget. You send one packet out and you hope that it will be received. There's no session buildup uh, like there is in TCP. And that enables attackers to just send a query out, a DNS query, with a spoofed source address. That means that the header in the IP package has the destination of some DNS server in the Internet. And the source address that defines from where this package is coming from is not the IP address of the machine sending, but it's the IP address of the victim's machine. The DNS server that we see here will now receive this DNS query, will work on it, and then it will send the answer to whatever was in the source address. And if the source address was spoofed, was a wrong address, then it sends the larger answer to that other machine, to the other IP address. That is possible because UDP is stateless and the source IP address can be easily spoofed. There are uh, a lot of tutorials and tools available free in the internet that um, show how this can be done, how uh, UDP packages can be just created with uh, a, a, any random source IP address. Now we have thousands or even millions of DNS servers in the internet. So what attackers can do is to send 
spoofed queries not only to one DNS server in the internet, but to many. And all the many DNS servers will respond with the larger answer and will send the answers to the victim's machine. And the network link of the victim's machine will be completely saturated if enough DNS servers will be used in this kind of attack. So a lot of people say that this is a DNSSEC problem because DNSSEC makes DNS answers so much bigger. While there is some truth in that, it is more that the DNSSEC deployment brought this issue into the light. The problem existed before DNSSEC. It's a problem that exists since DNS exists. And also it's not a problem that is inherent to DNS. There's some other protocols that we use on the internet today, uh, like uh, the network time protocol that is also based on UDP that has the same problems. So DNSSEC is not the, the, the root cause of the problem. Of course, DNSSEC, if deployed, will make the answers much bigger because of the digital signatures contained in the answers. So it clearly doesn't help if um, this kind of attacks are possible. So in this kind of attacks, uh, we have three parties involved. We have the attacker, uh, the person who is sending the DNS queries. We have the mirror server, that is some DNS server in the internet, and we can say that that is kind of the weapon being used by the attacker. And we have the victim, the recipient of the DNS traffic. That is the person that um, has the problems because the network link is then saturated by thousands and millions of millions of big DNS on the packages that the recipient has never asked for that data. It's just being received on the network link and is bringing down the whole network communication there. So if you operate a DNS server, you might provide a weapon for this kind of attacks. So what can we do? What can we as operators of DNS servers can do to stop these kind of attacks? There are multiple um, possibilities and I first created this presentation in winter of 2012 and it was skiing season so I categorized the different approaches like uh, ski slopes. So we have the, the easy slopes, the blue ones that uh, e even newbies can do. Uh, we have the more advanced tracks and we have the expert level ones. And I will present now a couple of solutions that can be, can be implemented to um, mitigate this kind of attacks. And they are categorized in easy, advanced and expert level. So the first is DNS monitoring. That is a little bit more advanced, but not really. It is about do you really know who is using your DNS? Might there be someone misusing your DNS? We find that uh, a lot of operators don't really know about their DNS traffic. Who is using them? What questions are asked to the DNS servers? What answers are given? How big are the answers? Is there any problems in there? Uh, DNS monitoring can reveal very interesting facts about networks and the quality and the health of a network in, in general. So knowing your DNS traffic is, uh, is the first step to, uh, to detect that someone is, is misusing the DNS service and uh, to uh, start working against this uh, uh, misuse. Luckily there are a lot of open source and commercial tools available that help with the DNS monitoring. Um, there's DNS Witness from the French registry, DNS Top from uh, Kaida, uh, the DNS Statistics Collector, all these are open source, Packet Q from the Swedish uh, top level uh, registry, and even Man and Mice has a commercial tool, the, the DNS Traffic Monitor. We will have uh, links to all these tools where you can find them, download them 
in the notes to this webinar. So if you detect this kind of, uh, sorry, if you detect this kind of attacks to your DNS infrastructure, that is your DNS server being used in these attacks, one of the first reactions is, um, hmm, I need a firewall. I need to block traffic uh, because if I block the traffic, this problem will go away. But this is not quite true. So the first instinct to block the source addresses doesn't work because the source addresses that we are seeing are, are not the source addresses from the attacker, it's a source address from the victim. And if we, if we automate this blocking, uh, because manual blocking is just way too much work because these attacks are coming from uh, botnets, uh, from a uh, thousand of uh, compromised machines out on the internet, so it's not possible to just manually put all the IP addresses in there. But there are some firewalls that have automatic uh, blacklisting. And you, you could be uh, thinking, oh, that, that is a good idea. If, if there's too many queries coming in from a given source address, I block that address. But that doesn't work because blocking would just harm the victim, not the attacker. Because the source address that we see, that is clearly the, the victim's address. And we, we never see the actual IP address from the, um, from the attacker because that is hidden. And the attacker can even turn this into a denial of service to your infrastructure, for example, by uh, using the source address of some well-known open DNS services uh, like Google's uh, service or uh, some high-level authoritative service like uh, Microsoft's authoritative or Facebook or some other service and then your clients uh, could not resolve uh, these names through the name service anymore. Clearly there is nothing we want. However, it is not impossible to fight a reflection attack through a firewall but it, it requires really very good firewall skills and most firewalls, even commercial ones, cannot do this. So you need to be a real TCP IP guru and a firewall guru, guru to, to do that. Uh, some people have done that, for example, with the Linux IP tables firewall. And what they've done is basically uh, they, they built a state table on the outgoing responses. So they basically do a response rate limiting on the firewall level. And they rebuild quite a, a number of functions that are usually in a DNS server in their firewall to be able to do this. We'll see that uh, there are other ways and easier ways to do the same on the DNS server level. If you want to go this route, if you want to implement something in the firewall, uh, you should talk to the people who already done that. There are some recipes in the internet in mailing lists uh, from people who uh, implemented um, mitigations against reflection attacks in firewalls, mostly in open source firewalls like the uh, Open BSD PF firewall or IP tables on Linux. So one easy thing that we all can do is check if our DNS server is an open resolver. All the bind versions, that is bind on Unix, uh, version 9.4 and older and also all Windows DNS servers. So no matter which Windows DNS, Windows 2003, 2008, and the new Windows 2012, are all open resolvers by default. If they are not being locked down by the administrators, they are an open resolver. So what actually is an open resolver? An open resolver is a DNS server that resolves names for any client in the Internet. So not only for the internal clients where a resolver should work, but also for everyone from the internet sending a query for an unrelated domain name, not the domain name that is the server's authority for, but any domain name. The open resolver will then go out, find the answer, and send the answer back. Uh, open resolvers are very easy targets to use by an attacker uh, for reflection attacks. So on Bind9, if you have a newer Bind servers, that is Bind95 and up, uh, they automatically limit the um, uh, recursive function 
to local networks and you need to expand that. But I've seen some DNS administrators that um, configured the uh, older behavior back in, that is allow recursion any, that is not a good idea. You should always limit the recursion to uh, the client networks. Uh, like we see that here in the uh, uh, configuration in the option block, you have allow recursion uh, local nets that uh, allows recursion for all the local attached networks. It's also possible to list there all the networks that uh, you have clients in. On Windows, it's a little bit uh, more complicated. Uh, not to configure it, but there's no way to restrict recursion on network blocks. Uh, you can only switch recursion on or off. It's an, um, a binary switch. So here you see in the properties, and this is Windows uh, 2012, in the DNS server properties, there is this check mark disable recursion, also disables forwarders. Every authoritative server, every server that is exposed directly to the internet, that is, can be queried from the internet, should have this check mark set. If not, it's an open uh, caching resolver. Here we have a small movie um, that is, um, has been created by, by Team Kimru and it shows the um, open resolvers being used in a DNS amplifier or DNS reflection attacks. And in, in this particular attack that happens in uh, April 2009, uh, there were over one million open recursive servers being used all over the world. You see the, the red dots appearing there. These are all uh, open resolvers being used somewhere in, in these attacks. And, and this attack was 30 gigabytes and that was just a, a, a tenth of the attacks that we have seen in the, in the past weeks. So this shows that, that these attacks are not really new, but they are getting more and more, um, they're getting bigger and bigger and more uh, troublesome. So there's also uh, an RFC, RFC 5358, that explains why uh, running an open resolver is a bad idea and how to lock down a DNS server. So um, that document is named Preventing Use of Recursive Name Service in Reflection Attacks. It's a, it's a good read if you want to learn more about these reflection attacks and how to uh, stop them. Another step that you can do, and it's also very easy, is the minimal responses. And that is a feature available in bind name servers on Unix. Also on bind name servers on Windows, of course. But it's not available on uh, a Microsoft DNS server at the moment. So what is minimal responses about? Um, DNS servers by nature are very, very helpful. They provide much more information that, than explicitly asked for. So here on the uh, left side, we have a request for nscs.nl for the MX racket. And what is important is the answer section. The answer section tells us um, the answer for the question. That is clearly what's needed and we cannot skip that. But the authority section, that contains the authoritative service for the answer, as well as the additional section, is completely uh, extra information, optional information that is being delivered here. The authority section is important uh, in referrals, but it's not important in direct answers like we see here. The additional section is not important at all. Most DNS servers today, if they receive an additional section, will uh, ignore the data there anyway because it's uh, uh, often not secure to use that data. But in the default configuration, the bind name server will just deliver all this information back. And all this information can be used because it's, an, it's a big answer. Uh, what we can do is, in the option block, configure minimal responses yes or minimal responses on. Just one line in the configuration file, reload your name server, and then uh, bind will only send that data that is really, really required to fulfill the request, but nothing more. 
And here we see an example, um, a statistics from uh, an authoritative name server from SurfNet. SurfNet is the university network in, uh, in the Netherlands. And they had problems with uh, their servers being misused by reflection attacks and they implemented minimal responses on the second week this year in January. And you see the, the steep drop there in the, 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 the traffic. And, and that is the outgoing traffic from one of their, their DN servers. So implementing minimal responses reduces the, the ammo available for the attackers. It makes the answers much smaller. So uh, a reflection attack is less um, appealing for the attackers. So the, the very probably best mitigation strategy is to implement response rate limiting. And um, response rate limiting builds on the observation of the three roles, roots of good DNS, which are that clients never send queries directly to authoritative servers. Clients should always send queries to caching servers first. Authoritative servers on the other side, they never answer uh, to clients. They only answer to caching servers. And of course, and, and that might be a surprise here, caching servers should cache responses. So if a caching server has requested uh, one information already um, some, some time before, and, the and, and uh, there is a longer time to live on this data, uh, it should have this data in the cache and should not ask again. So based on this observation, we can say um, that if all good answers are cacheable, and good answers, we mean uh, either we get a good positive answer, there's no error condition, and the answer is being delivered to uh, the requesting caching server, or it is a good negative answer. Uh, there can be the domain does not exist, annex domain answer, or there can be the record type does not exist for this name, which is the no error plus no data answer. All these three answers will be cached. And while it is cached, a caching server should not continuously ask the same question again and again and again. In these reflection attacks, we see exactly the happening that the same spoofed address is asking for the same data again and again and again. So it can clearly not be a real caching name server. So if all DNS queries should go through the caching name server and identical queries should not see from the same source inside the time to live of the DNS query again. So if we see recurring queries inside the time to live from the same source or going out to the same destination basically, it's likely an attack or it could be crappy software. But more likely it's an attack. So response rate limiting um, works in this way that it limits the number of identical responses sent to a given network. So it doesn't work on individual addresses, it works on full networks, like full slash 24 networks. The reason here is because uh, the attackers in reflection attacks don't try to attack uh, single machines on a network, they try to attack a whole network. So they spoof not only a single address, but they spoof uh, random addresses from that whole network that they try to attack. So response rate limiting works in counting the responses going to a given network. And if there are too much identical responses to a given network, uh, where there should be a caching name server, it uh, starts to, to throttle the outgoing responses. So it does not send a response for every query that is coming in. This behavior on an authoritative server allows legislative clients uh, in the victim's network to still resolve DNS data. And that is the big difference between uh, doing uh, blocking in a firewall, uh, because if we block in a firewall, we also penalize the, the victim. If the victim wants to reach our DNS server, our authoritative DNS server to look up our DNS data, it is also blocked because it's the IP address being seen in the attack. In response rate limiting, uh, a real client coming from that network will still get uh, an answer. As another trick, 
if such an attack is detected, response rate limiting will send uh, in between the normal UDP answers, it will send almost empty answers, that is just the header uh, and the um, parts of the, the question section with the so-called TC flag in the header set. TC stands for truncated answer. And that's a normal DNS condition that's been used if the answer is too big to fit in a UDP answer package, which is by default it's 512 byte. But we can use this at any time. And uh, the response rate limiting code does this and sends TC flags whenever it takes an attack condition. And that uh, triggers the remote client to use TCP to retry the same query again over TCP, not UDP. And that then usually works because uh, TCP is a little bit slower than UDP, but it's much, much harder to spoof. Um, and there we will see the real query from a real client and not the attack packages. And so the real client will still get uh, DNS data resolved. And here is a, a, a picture, a graph from an uh, authoritative DNS server from a very busy um, uh, organization. And they implemented uh, response rate limiting in the bind name servers at one point of time. And you see this, this teardrop of outgoing data. In the, the peaks here, we see this 2.3 gigabyte of, of DNS data being sent out from one DNS server. And after response rate limiting has been turned on, uh, it is below 0 0.1 gigabits of uh, DNS data being sent out. So uh, response rate limiting really, really works fine in, in this kind of attacks. So where is this available? Uh, you get response rate limiting for Unix uh, DNS server. There is a uh, by 9 patch from Vernon Shriver and uh, Paul Vixi. Uh, it can be found in the internet if you um, search for bind and response rate limiting, you find the patch. It's open source. You can download that. You can patch it against the, the vanilla bind sources and build your own bind. It will also be rolled into the official bind uh, release 9.10 that will be out sometime in summer. There's also NSD, uh, the name server daemon from NL Net Labs, um, open source uh, name servers, very fast. And there's NL3 that has the uh, response rate limiting patch and NSD4 is currently in development and that will have the uh, response rate limiting patch from the beginning. Unfortunately, there's currently no response rate limiting available for the Windows server, at least not to my knowledge. Because we know that uh, some customers and some users out on the internet is, are not really um, familiar and happy to uh, download uh, source code and, and apply a patch and then build bind for themselves on the operating system, Minimize makes um, bind installation packages from the latest bind version, which is 992 patch 2, available free of charge. And you can download that. And we have that for Red Hat, Red Hat 5 and 6. Uh, that includes also CentOS. Uh, we have Debian, and the Debian packages also work fine on Ubuntu. Uh, we have Solaris 10 and 11 for both uh, Intel and Spark architecture. And we have macOS 10 uh, from uh, uh, macOS 10 Tiger, that is 10.4, up to the latest Mountain Lion 10.8. And this is the download URL. It's supportminimize.com slash download slash bind and look for the packages with uh, the, the um, encoding RRL in the name, because there is both the, the normal uh, binds and the ones with the uh, response rate limiting patch enabled. And all the, the downloads that have the RRL in the download name uh, have the uh, response rate limiting patch. So once you use the response rate limiting patch, all you need to do is in the option block configure the rate limiting and um, that is supported uh, also by the Menomize suite, the graphical user interface for bind as well in the Menomize DNS appliance. But also if you just have a stock bind on, on a Unix operating system, works the same way. You open the uh, bind configuration file named d.conf, you look for the option block and there you fill in a rate limit block 
default setting is responses per second five and in a window of five. That means it, it counts um, the, the number of responses to a given network and if there's more than five identical responses to a given network per second, then it goes into the response rate limiting um, mode for that network and starts to throttle the, uh, the answers. That is the default setting and that works fine for, for most networks and for most situations. There's an alternative approach to the same problem that works a little bit different. It's called DNS dampening. It's from Lutz Donnerhacker. And uh, he has written uh, a long um, uh, blog article about that. And he also has a bind nine patch uh, available. So uh, another st step that we can do to prevent these kind of attacks is uh, implement uh, BCP uh, 38. And that is uh, network ingress filtering. Basically means making IP address spoofing for UDP impossible. And that works on the network level. That's not a DNS thing that we do, but it's in uh, routers uh, where we configure that um, we only forward packages that uh, leave our network that have the source address of our own networks so that we don't send out UDP uh, packages which have a source address of uh, some foreign network which is clearly a spoofed address. Um, this um, uh, best current practice uh, 38 is uh, being uh, documented in NRC 2827 already 13 years old. It's from May 2000. So it has been there uh, a long, long time. And it would be the real fix if there's, uh, I mean, all the response rate limiting, all the work in firewalls, it's just uh, uh, a workaround uh, to, to, to mitigate the real problem. Uh, because the real problem is, is, is the, the spoofing of addresses. And uh, if we solve this in DNS, maybe the attackers then move to SNMP or move to an NTP, and we need to fix, fix it there as well. So the real, the best fix is to, uh, to um, stop it on the, at the root cause, and that is uh, in the network, in the, in the routing tables, in, in the routers itself, and implement this uh, network ingress filter. Uh, even though it has been around for 13 years, many, many network operators don't implement it. Uh, there are a couple of excuses, don't have time, don't have the knowledge, don't have the money to do that. Oh, not my department, I don't have problem for that. So there are always ex uh, excuses. But um, if you operate a network, have a look at it, read the RC, read the documentation that is available on the internet and then, then implement it. It's uh, today, not so much a big problem uh, because the, the router hardware is uh, usually big enough and powerful enough to do it. Uh, if you have a firewall, there's a, a firewall that can do it uh, right away with uh, uh, some, some anti-spoof rules in there. If you are a customer and you are not in charge of the network, then ask your service provider to implement it. Uh, as a customer, you have some, some power, of course. It's always a hassle to uh, to move away from one ISP and to go to another, but if uh, you uh, are shopping for a new uh, service provider anyway, then you should um, make that a check mark on the list of what should be there if you um, consider a new service provider for your networks. So that is everything that can be done to prevent these attacks. Uh, and. Um, what is now happening or what can we do if we are the victim of an attack? Now, surviving a denial of service, especially a distributed denial of service attack, is, is mostly a matter of preparation. Once the attack is underway, there's not really much you can do. Of course, you can then talk to your ISP and have the ISP help you to, to mitigate, to black hole some of the traffic, but uh, best is to be prepared beforehand. The problem is most of the time the network link saturation. It's not so much a server load, especially if it is an attack on a on your DNS server infrastructure. Uh, it's it's not the server that is going down; it's the network link that's going down. So having a, a load balancer or having multiple DNS servers in the same data center doesn't really help a lot here. 
it's the, the network that needs to be able to withstand the, the attack. And the problem there is also that not only the way inside is blocked, if you use the same network connection to uh, reach uh, other machines in the internet, that is your clients are using uh, the same network connection, then uh, all the connection to the outside world might be also be blocked. What you can do is talk to your uh, network provider, to your upstream provider, are they prepared for a distributed down of service? Uh, be prepared in the way that you have the contacts uh, from your upstream provider, um, the, the technical contacts that you directly can call them and, and uh, work with them. To, um, to mitigate this, this kind of text to black hole some of the traffic. If it is a, uh, an attack directly on DNS server infrastructure, one thing that you can do is to use DNS Anycast. In short, Anycast is a technology in the internet to have multiple servers in the internet with the same IP address and the same DNS content. And the routing uh, and in, in the internet is uh, mostly BGP, BGP routing uh, is then deciding which one of the different instances of the DNS service is visible from a certain place in the net. And if you have any casting, then um, the attacks are spread out. Um, sometimes they are confined in, in just one region and all the other DNS services are not affected or not fully affected. We will cover uh, DNS Anycast and, and how that really works on the technical level, on the, on the network level, and how you can implement that yourself in one of the upcoming seminars. Uh, for now, I can say that um, uh, if you don't have the knowledge of Anycasting and, and in your house, there are very good commercial DNS secondary providers uh, that, that offer Anycasted secondary DNS service, so you still can manage your own DNS. But you uh, then, uh, by zone transfer, you um, uh, transfer your DNS data to secondaries, and these secondaries are then any cast servers around the world. And um, it's very hard to bring down uh, such an, an any cast uh, any cast DNS server system. And the minimized service team can surely help you in implementing DNS Anycast, either in your own infrastructure or by helping a, a trusted provider of a commercial secondary service. So, a summary of uh, here, we have a checklist. Um, we should make sure that we don't run an open DNS resolver. That's easy to do. Consider implementing minimal responses if you're running a bind name server. That is just one line of configuration and helps a lot. Um, implement response rate limiting. That's a little bit more work because you have to uh, upgrade your bind version. But then again, uh, it's, uh, it's an installer package and um, you can download that if you are. Um, uh, afraid that you lose the, the, the service contract with your operating system vendor, talk to us. Uh, Minimize is also um, providing service contracts for the, the bind packages we, um, uh, we provide and uh, we can also give you the, the backup here. And uh, turn on ingress filtering, that is BGP38 uh, if possible, and know your DNS traffic. Know if you are under attack or if your DNS infrastructure is being used for an attack. Because if, if your DNS infrastructure has been used for an attack, it also uh, hurts your customers and maybe your clients um, because it takes away resources from your DNS service systems. So, um, Bob, do we have questions? Well, thank you, Karsten. I mean, uh, this certainly was a tremendous amount of information for many of us to digest today. And yes, let's entertain some questions. Attendees, you may ask your questions simply by typing the question in the chat box down in the bottom of the GoToWebinar session, or you can click uh, raise your hand on the GoToWebinar panel. Please keep in mind, we are more than happy to have you remain anonymous if you'd like. And let's see, there are some questions coming in. 
Um, okay, so Karsten, this one is probably for you. Anthony asks, can bind with the rate limit patch be used to secure a caching DNS server? Yeah, that's a common question that also comes up from time to time on the rate limiting, rate limiting mailing list. Uh, the rate limiting, limiting patches for bind are developed for authoritative servers in mind. They have not been designed for caching servers and they should, I mean, they are not a way to uh, operate a, an open resolver and like uh, being then on the safe side of operating and open resolving the internet. That's, that's not the case. However, uh, some people have, uh, ISPs have tested the bind version with a rate limiting uh, on a recursive server because they say that, uh, of course, they need to enable recursion for all their clients, but they don't have control of their clients and there might be a, a one or two clients that have a virus or something nasty installed that is part of a botnet and then are sending out um, these, these requests in, in reflection attacks. And they found out that, yes, uh, the uh, rate limiting patch can help in these situations. However, keep in mind that the rate limiting patch, um, one of the um, ideas behind that is that um, it's on an authoritative server that's being used by uh, a caching server and that a caching server caches answers and will never ask the same query again and again. Client systems, depending on the client systems, don't have a cache. Some do, but some don't. If a client is there that doesn't have a cache, uh, there might be a lot of queries coming from that client for the same uh, request again and again and again. So if we, like today, if we browse the web, almost every website has this Facebook like it button and the Twitter here and uh, what, what not, and uh, every page impression on the web page will, will make a request for Twitter and a request for Google and a request for Facebook and it can then very easily that this, um, um, this client goes into the, the rate limiting page. So um, if you do that, um, carefully monitor your DNS server and you probably have to tweak the, uh, the rate limiting uh, uh, numbers and, and, and configuration a little bit, make it work for caching server. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for that, Karsten. Uh, let's see, there is another one. Eric wants to know, can I see amplification attacks in a query log? Yes, probably yes. Um, but having the query log running all the time is, is not a good idea because it's quite resource uh, consuming. Um, yeah, if, if you, if you um, uh, run the query log and that is uh, basically a log file that is uh, logging every query coming into a, a bind name server or to a Microsoft name server. You can um, look at that log and of course if you see uh, a big number of queries coming in for always the same name from the same uh, source address which is of course the address of the victim. Uh, then you can see that as uh, yeah, it's a reflection attack and you can see it in the query log. But I, I recommend to use some other kind of um, uh, DNS monitoring that is working more on the network level like, um, like something um, uh, works like TCP dump because that doesn't uh, take so much resources from the DNS server itself. Uh, a DNS server that has query logging enabled can very easily be overwhelmed by being part of a reflection attack. Okay, thanks for that one. We're getting an awful lot of questions regarding the same topic, uh, but I'll go ahead and uh, answer this one myself. There's a lot of folks asking if the slides are going to be available and also the recording. Yes, we will make both the slides and the recording available. Sounds like not just for yourself, but there's others. Uh, Paul was looking for it, Suzanne, uh, Peter, so quite a few people looking for that. Uh, but we will make that available to everyone and also for your colleagues in case they were not able to join the session. Will that be on the web page or do we send out emails? 
Well, we will do both. Uh, if you signed up for the webinar, you will get an email that's going to point you really to our website uh, where you can then uh, download the slides and also look at the recording. We don't send the recording itself only because it's rather large size-wise, but you can view it from the Ben and Mice website. Okay, here's another one from Thomas. Uh, he wants to know, is there a way to test if the rate limit patch works? Uh, yes, if you, if you have the rate limit patch enabled, there's a new uh, login category um, that is called rate limit. And you should go into your bind login configuration and um, configure an extra log file uh, for for rate limit for the for the category rate limit, uh, and and send that to a log file channel, and then you see whenever um, the rate limit patch gets uh, enabled, you see a log entry. It tells you um, from which source network this uh, this attack is coming from, and for which uh, resource name is being re requested. Resource bracket is requested and you see that in log files. Of course, if you don't want to wait for uh, an attack to happen, what you can do is to, to run the, the dig command, which is the, the DNS query tool, that, the command line tool that comes with bind. I run that in a, in a tight loop, uh, sending queries against your name server, and, and that will be seen as an attack, because it's, uh, it might just make sure that it sends more than five queries per second, uh, which is easily done on a, on a normal system. And then you see it, it kicking on immediately. And uh, if you stop it, then you see in the logs also that uh, after some time it will stop uh, seeing um, or rate limiting that, that I, I address, that network address. But don't do it from, from a production network because you don't want probably your production network being, being rate limited just because of test. Okay, um, we do have another one here. If implementing RRL is not feasible, are there any other techniques, maybe on the firewall or IPS, that can be used in the meantime with maybe similar effect? Okay. Uh, can you repeat the, the, the beginning again? I didn't go that. Yeah, sure. If implementing RRL is not feasible, are there any other techniques that can be used in the meantime with a similar effect? Yeah, basically, yeah. The, the other what I know of is um, to do rate limiting in the firewall. Uh, and uh, but that is not easy um, because, to my knowledge, but I don't know every firewall product in the world, but the ones that I know don't have a simple uh, rate limit DNS switch. Uh, so you have to build, carefully build a couple of firewall rules that mimic the result. Basically what you want to do is you want to filter rate limiting on outgoing traffic, not on the incoming traffic. Because you want to filter and rate limit in the firewall um, for all the answers that are going to the same network segment. And uh, I haven't done it myself, but there are a couple of people who've done it with the IP tables firewall in Linux. And I'm currently researching uh, doing that in the PF packet filter firewall in OpenBSD, but I'm not quite done with that yet. If, if that is being done, I will publish that as a, a, lock, a block entry on the Menomize web page, uh, probably uh, yeah, in a couple of weeks uh, once I have fully tested it. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ken would like to know, Kenneth that is, um, then your rate limiting value should be greater than the shortest TTL of a record. Um, yes, um, yeah, because um, the um, um, because uh, if the TTL of course is very short then you will see recurring queries for that. And that can be um, the case if um, uh, someone has a very short um, TTLs because of load balancing, th that can happen. 
uh, where a load balancer automatically changes DNS records and uh, to, to load balance uh, stuff to, to a web server. Uh, yes, then then you need to tweak the um, uh, the configuration of the rate limiting. Uh, what is possible is to um, to specifically whitelist or, or yeah whitelist specific uh, networks or resource records being requested if if there are specific resource records uh, that can uh, trigger false uh, positives uh, for the rate limiting uh, that can be then in in the configuration being whitelisted. Okay, we have one from, from Rohan, wants to know, are reflection attacks also done against caching servers and to what extent? Um, yeah, they are primarily done uh, with caching servers, especially with uh, open resolvers, so that, that is the problem. Um, we haven't seen really uh, these attacks coming uh, to caching servers that are uh, not open in the internet. So if you have a caching server just in your organization or if you are an ISP operating in for for these kind of attacks. Okay. Here's another one. Peter says, Karsten, were there any cases where non-recursive servers hosting, for example, just one particular external zone also employed in such attacks? Little servers that host minimi uh, sorry, host uh, Strutman DE, which is a very tiny zone, and it's just for my my hobby homepage. Um, I've I've run my own bind DNS servers as well, and I uh, fairly early when the patch came out, I, I just installed it to test it, but I never expected my DNS servers to be used in in an attack, and uh, the I installed it in November 2012. And the first attack happened um, uh, that the rate limiting patch catched was over Christmas. So 21st December, there was a couple of, of attacks, three of them, uh, where someone tried to use my authoritative name servers. Um, and the, that server just has a, a couple of very tiny zones, basically just one A record and an MX record. So even if you are a small person in the internet, uh, your DNS servers can still be misused. Okay, uh, thanks for that one. We have one from uh, Par, is wants to know, one option to fight off spoofed DNS requests that generate large responses is to have an inline IPS intercepting the traffic and telling the client to use TCP instead. If the client is a legitimate client, a TCP session will be established and the request passed to the DNS server. What is your experience with this technique? I don't have experience with an IPS, which is an intrusion protection system. Uh, but basically that is uh, very much the same that the rate limiting patch for bind does. If, um, if it works n with normal UDP DNS uh, when it is uh, in the normal mode, but once it detects an attack pattern, it switches for that network into the rate limiting mode, and in that rate limiting mode, it does exactly what is uh, asked here or is explained here. Uh, it um, sends out or it forces the client to use TCP instead. It, it does not force it for, for every request, uh, just like it's a random, like every second or every third uh, DNS request where it's, it's forcing TCP. But that works very fine. That, uh, the the uh, experience is very good with this technique. 
Um, the downside here is um, that, and, and the reason why uh, the rate limiting patch is not 100% going for TCP is that there are still firewall administrators out there in the internet that believe that DNS is only UDP and they block TCP DNS on their firewalls. And the client that would be behind such a misconfigured firewall would be out of luck if it would be forced to use only TCP. So the rate limiting patch is doing both. It, it just, it, it, it rate limits, it's throttling UDP and it's forcing every third or, or fifth request to use TCP. So if there's a client um, that is, uh, cannot reach the, um, the authoritative server over UDP, it will get uh, this TC flex set being forced to use TCP and then usually it works if there is not a firewall in between that is misconfigured and stopping DNS TCP traffic. So yeah, I, I would say with an IPS system that does the same, probably works well as, as well. Um, just make sure that the IPS does not force 100% TCP because that can create the problems on the far end side with the firewalls. Okay, well, thanks for that. We do have, it looks like, one more, uh, if you have time. Abdullah would like to know, what is the usual downtime during the update of the bind on Solaris 10 running Spark if we want to upgrade to the latest bind server? Mm -hmm. um, it depends. <laughs> Um, it depends on, 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 on how good it, that is prepared. Um, there's uh, two ways to do the updates. Um, the, there's um, uh, Menomize is providing two types of packages. One is the uh, um, one is, a, is an installer package that mimics the default install from from Oracle. That is, it, it is a in-place replacement. In order to use that, you first have to deinstall the old bind and then install the new bind, which can take two minutes, roughly, depending on the speed of your machine, but usually it takes two minutes or so. The downtime would be two minutes, which is not too bad because we, we're talking here about authoritative servers, and authoritative servers have uh, or should have secondaries. Uh, so if you take one server down, all the other secondaries are still online, and so clients will reach them. Nobody will see that some machine is down. It's different with caching servers. And then you can can upgrade one and one and one uh, after time. Um, to further minimize the downtime, we have the special uh, men and mice flavored packages. Uh, men and mice flavored packages don't install bind in the same directory as the or Oracle packages, but they install that in uh, I think OPT bind and in a way that they install OPT bind version number. So you can install multiple versions of bind at the same time. They don't collide. And then it's just a matter of setting one symbolic link uh, pointing to the new version uh, to, to switch over to the, new, to the new version. And that is done in a matter of milliseconds. So the downtime is usually not uh, you, you stop the old bind, you switch the, um, the sublink, and then you start the new bind, and, and that is, is less than, than, than a minute, of course. Um, and the, the other benefit of that approach is that it's easy the same way to step back, to roll back. So if you, dis if you detect that something is wrong with the new version, for whatever reason, uh, your old version is still there. You can just switch back. Um, in the a download folder for for Solaris. I think there's a README file that explains how it works, and there's um, a, a shell script called SwitchBind uh, that is being can be used to automatically uh, select a version and do the switch of the symlink automatically. And if you have more um, a question about that scheme and and how that works on Solaris, I'm uh, happy to to answer that by by email. We have a couple of customers that use that scheme and are very happy in. Uh, minimizing downtime with that scheme. 
Okay, we are really uh, past the top of the hour, but I think, and Abdullah thanks you for that answer. Uh, you're quite welcome there. We will have time for one more question, I believe. Douglas, we're going to squeeze yours in. He wants to know, I log all DNS requests on my DNS server. If a client is making abnormal amount of requests, it gets temporarily blocked. Why wouldn't I want to block UPD sessions altogether if TCP is much safer? Because TCP is slower. It's much slower because the TCP session is, uh, you have this three-way handshake in the beginning and, and then you transfer the data and then you, ha you tear down, which is again a three-way handshake. Uh, that is, again, the, the, the building up a TCP session is, is more data and takes longer than the original DNS request itself. So it's, it's a magnitude slower to use TCP for DNS. That is a question that has been discussed uh, over and over in the, in the ITF to, to use TCP for that. Um, yeah, that is one reason. It, it would just it wouldn't scale enough in the in the internet if everyone would use uh, DNS over TCP. The second reason is uh, probably the one that I already mentioned that there are enough firewalls in the world that block TCP DNS because the DN the firewall administrator doesn't see that uh, DNS can also go over TCP. There's a a couple of firewall administrators that think that uh, DNS over TCP is only zone transfer, which is not true. It can be just normal query and answer uh, communication that can go over TCP. For these two reasons, uh, using exclusively a TCP DNS is uh, not a good idea. Okay. Well, you answered all of the questions, uh, so thank you so much for that. And since there are no further questions that I'm seeing, I would like to personally thank you for taking the time, everyone, to join our webinar. This one specifically on the dangers of DNS reflection attacks and how to mitigate them. On behalf of the entire Men and Mice team, we thank you for attending this event and certainly look forward to you and your team joining us in the future for our other webinar series. This does conclude our webinar. Good day and goodbye for now. Thank you. Goodbye.